Hey, hi, hello, and welcome to... That was so cute. Oh my God. Okay, not me being adorable. Hey, hi, hello. Welcome to Bites of History with Irene Walton. I am your host, Irene Walton. Today, we are talking about a lot of people's favorite Dunkin' Donuts. Have you ever wondered how it made it to your table? Have you ever wondered how it made it to your shelf? If you love food, then this is the show for you. Bites of History with Irene. Thank you guys so much for joining this week's episode. And to any of my viewers who watched last Friday's video, I got so much love and positivity and joy from that comment section. So thank you so much for you guys being supportive. I'm really, really lucky to have all of you in my life and in my corner. Okay, so today we are going to be talking about America's favorite, who America runs on, Dunkin' Donuts. I am going to be honest with you right off the bat. I have never personally at least in my knowledge, had Dunkin' Donuts. I may have had a bite of a donut once at like a party a couple years ago, but Dunkin' Donuts has never been my like go-to, but I know so many people are fatal for it. When it opened in 2015 um, in Los Angeles, like where I'm from, people went feral, like it was crazy. So we're going to talk all about the history of it today, its founder, its trials, its tribulations, and its delicious little munchkins, which have this whole crazy story too. So let's begin at the beginning and we will end at the end. But first, we have to thank our patrons. Thank you guys so much. I got a bunch of new patrons in the Patreon, so thank you all for joining. You guys can see your names down in the description below. You can join the Patreon for just $2 a month at patreon.com slash Irene Walton. We do so much stuff on there. It is a way to support the podcast, to support me, to support, you know, a a local little lady who's just trying to get by. (laughs) Um, so thank you so much to my patrons, new and old. I am so, so grateful to have you guys. And thank you so much to the sources of this podcast, the Food That Built America podcast, which I'm obsessed with, um, the Hook YouTube channel and news.dunkindonuts.com, as well as a little bit of info from Wikipedia. So the year is 1916 and William Rosenberg is born. His parents were Jewish German immigrants from Prussia that moved to Boston, Massachusetts in the Boston, Massachusetts, in a little area called Dorchester, which I would love to hear somebody from Boston say it. I feel like it'd be like Dorchester, 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 Dorchester. I don't know. I've never been to Boston. I really want to go, though. Uh, Something about that accent does it for me. They move out there. They have Bill and they have his brother. And I'm going to, just so you know, I'm going to be saying Bill and William interchangeably because everywhere you hear it, everyone calls him a different thing. And somehow Bill is short for William. Their parents own a grocery store and it's doing okay, but it is still struggling. And Bill at 10 years old starts to pick up like little odd jobs. He helps uh, the ice cream guy sell ice cream. He delivers ice. He shines shoes. And this whole time, he was very happy to do it. He really believed in service. He really believed in like a positive attitude and just like getting stuff done and feeling good about it, which I really relate to and really love. So then a couple years later, the depression hits and Bill is 13 years old. He's in eighth grade and he on his own volition decides to drop out of eighth grade. His parents are not very happy about it. They really believed in education, but Bill was like, no, I'm going to make this work. I'm going to help you guys. We're going to get through this depression no matter what. And they did. They did make it through actually, which was, you know, pretty rare for a lot of people. And he was a telegram deliverer. So he worked for the Western Union and He's this little 13 year old on his bike delivering telegrams. And he realizes that the faster he pedals his bike, the more telegrams that get delivered, the more money he's making. So he is like a hard worker from 13 years old. I don't know why it took you so long to remember how old he was. He is a hard worker. And this is going to be integral to his success as the years come. But one thing at a time. So Bill is making pretty good money, but at 16 years old, he's like, you know what? Western Union isn't enough for me anymore. I want to be making more. And he moves over to Simcoe, which which is a refrigerated ice cream truck kind of company. And here at Simcoe is where Bill's life is going to change. Have you guys ever met one of those people that you're like, teach me anything you were willing to teach me and I will listen. Like I will hang on every single word that you say. This happens when Bill meets Harry Winokur. Harry Winokur is the accountant for Simcoe and he is a very, very good businessman. He knows all about spreadsheets and 
taxes. I don't know what he did, but he was an accountant and he was great at the business side of things. And Bill was like, hook me up with that daddy. I need your help. This ended up changing Bill's whole life. So Harry does so much for William. He teaches him all about the business side of, well, business. (laughs) business. <laughs> he teaches them all about the numbers and that aspect of things that Bill didn't know too much about. Harry also introduces him to his soon to be wife, Bookie, um, who is his sister in law. So they're related. Now, Bill and Harry are actually like related by law. They they move to a nice area like it's life. Cha- it's a life changing move for Bill, like going to Simcoe because he meets Harry now. While he's at Simcoe, he does really, really well. However, World War II starts and William actually gets drafted for World War II. And when you're getting drafted, I guess, I I mean, I have not been drafted, thankfully. But when you were getting drafted, if you had an essential job, you did not necessarily have to go to war. So William was like, well, I would like to go find an essential job, which Simcoe unfortunately was not. So he was like, where can I go? What can I do? So he left Simcoe and went to the docks, like the ports where these port workers would work. And he was like, I can work here. This is an essential job. I will do this. So the port worker manager guy was like, hey, uh, we can offer you like a minimum wage job. And Will was like, absolutely not. Like, I'm just leaving a national sales representative position at Simcoe. I'm going to need a little more than that. I have a refrigeration uh, electric. Uh, like a refrigeration electricity degree, which he did have technically, but it wasn't like he like really worked for it. It was just a part of working for Simcoe. He had like acquired it. And so the manager was like, okay, great. Yeah, you can be an electrician. However, on the first day at the job at the docks being an electrician, Bill got electrocuted. He was okay. But um, the manager was like, so you lied? And Bill was like, yeah, of course. (laughs) But the manager really believed in William and was like, you know what? That's okay. We're going to get you around the other electricians. They're going to teach you some stuff and you will learn. And William Rosenberg was like, that sounds great. Thank you so much. He now had an essential job and did not have to go to World War II. So while he is becoming an electrician, he then gets approached by International Luncheon Services, which is kind of like what you would imagine, kind of like a food truck to be. Not like a Kogi truck. It's not like cool and making crazy tacos, but it's like sandwiches and coffee and stuff that would go by places like the dock, uh, the dock workers docks and (laughs) would, you know, bring sandwiches, bring lunch, whatever. Will gets approached by international lunch and services. And they're like, Hey, oh my God, come work for us. We loved what you did at Simcoe. And this is while he's an electrician at the docks. And he was like, Oh, like, thank you so much, but no. And they were like, we'll give you a third of the company. You just have to buy it for $2,500. So Will is like, Okay, work. So he gets a thousand dollar loan from his mom. He joins in the company and he starts working with them. Now he quadruples the uh, International Lunch and Services sales, ILS. He quadruples ILS's sales. And he's like, oh my God, I'm crushing this. Now, what he did not know is that these guys were probably not the best to get into business with. They were sort of like shady characters and were selling stuff on the black market. And he did not want to be involved with that. He removed himself from that situation, did not get his money back and was forced to move into his parents' house into one room with his wife and his three kids. This is where things get a little crazy. Will is making ends meet, but he still has all of this knowledge that he has gained being an electrician, working with Harry, working at ILS and get and seeing kind of how this food and beverage industry works as well. Now, he didn't get a lot from them. He definitely didn't get his money back, like we said before, but he did see what sold. And he noticed that coffee was about 40 percent of their sales when he was working at ILS, the, the catering place. And he was like, wow, that coffee sold really well. It kind of tasted like ass, but it sold really well. I want to do something like that. Now, what was interesting about coffee at the time is that it is not like what we think of now. Like, I know we all have that one friend who's like, I'm going to do a pour over carafe of Colombian blend. Like, I don't know. I don't drink. I don't know coffee. I drink it, but I don't know what it is. (laughs) I don't know what it is. But he was like, I've had good coffee before and everybody else is drinking these like flavorless crystals that you reheat with boiling water and it tastes like flavored water or it tastes burnt. Like it's not good. So he's like, I'm going to start my own little food catering truck company 
And I'm going to sell really good coffee and I'm going to sell donuts because they're super cheap. And I'm going to sell some little sandwiches and some snacks. He thought of this because when he was at the docks and when he was working around the ports and stuff, he noticed that these workers would all bring their own lunch and it didn't look super good, didn't look really appetizing and they didn't have coffee. So with this idea, he knows he's going to need some mobility, a way to get around. And he finds 10 telephone company like chassis that were out of commission, which a chassis is basically just like the frame of an automobile. So he then customizes, like customizes it and makes it into a little luncheonette that is now mobile, has like barely any overhead. And he is bringing it around to the docks and selling them sandwiches and coffee and donuts. And what's interesting is that everybody told him that the coffee would not work. He was charging 10 cents a cup when most places, like even high-end hotels and stuff, were charging 5 cents a cup. And he was like, listen, they're charging 5 cents a cup for 6 ounces of ass water, (laughs) and I'm charging 10 cents a cup for 12 ounces of delicious coffee. Now, another thing that was really important to William was purchasing really good cream and really good milk that people could add into their coffees from local dairies. So he was really, really focusing on quality, and this was what changed things for him. This is what got him some popularity. It's at this point in time where William Rosenberg reaches back out to Harry Winokur and is like, hey, I'm starting my business venture. I want your help. I really trust your business sense. Can you help me out? And Harry is like, absolutely. So he has these 10 little luncheonettes that Harry is helping him with on the business side of things. And it's going really, really well. He's also noticing, again, a similar pattern that happened with the ILS trucks. 40% of the sales were coming from the donuts and coffee that they had on the trucks. And Harry was like, that's it. Like, why are we wasting our time with sandwiches if these are our most profitable items? So he's like, Harry, here's the tea. We are going to open up just a coffee and sandwich shop. And Harry was like, no, we're not. And (laughs) he's like, that's a bad idea. We're literally doing fine. Like, why are we going to try to like, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it kind of vibe. And William was like, it's broken my head. I want to reach for the stars. So he did just that. They start focusing on just coffee and donuts, and it's going really, really well. And again, Williams wants to kind of shake the boat a little bit and see how far they can go and is like, let's open a brick and mortar. And Harry Winokur is like, no, let's not. (laughs) I don't want to do that. Everything is going great. And in 1948, the brick and mortar open kettle is established. It's called open kettle because that is what was used to make donuts back then was this big open kettle of oil. And that's how they made the donuts. Now, William was a little shifty during this situation because He would be like having a business meeting with Harry and being like, yeah, no, we're going to have sandwiches at Open Kettle, obviously. And then he would be on the phone with the people who were like providing the ingredients and be like, no, yeah, just the coffee and donuts. Like, let's just get that to the store and that'll be it. So whatever. But Harry wasn't too upset because they saw how successful this was because you guys, their business model was amazing. So one night, William Rosenberg is eating at a Howard Johnson's, which is like a little restaurant. And he notices that they have 28 flavors of ice cream. And he's like, huh, 28 flavors, huh? Let's do 52 flavors of donuts, one for every week of the year. (laughs) Let's change from one donut and some coffee to 52 different donuts. And you guys, this is so smart. This sort of gives me like, like Instagram foodie energy of like, oh, we got to see what the new flavor is. Oh, we got to see what this new restaurant is. And I'm not saying that as a negative. I literally do that exact same thing. But like, it was the 1948 version of that. It was like, Oh, what's this week's flavor? Because everybody's had a glazed donut. If you had a glazed donut last week, you're probably like, I don't need another one. I just had one. But if you had a passion fruit donut last week and now there's a lemon poppy seed donut available, you didn't just have that last week. Let's go back and see what next week's is and the week after that. So he's now having returning customers that are excited by this new idea and keep coming back, keep bringing their friends. And it's doing great. Harry and William are both so happy. A couple years later, though, William is like, listen, open kettle sort of gives me like old energy. Like it's a little too like old school. I don't like the name. We have to change it. So one day in a board meeting, they're sitting around and they're thinking about what the new name could be. And one of the board members is like, ah, you know, you pluck a chicken, you dunk a donut. And then William is like, 
great. Dunkin' Donuts done because they had noticed that everybody's dunking their donuts in the coffee and they didn't know if it was a regional thing. They didn't know if it was an American thing, but they were like, this is it. This is the name. It works. So from like 1952 on, it's called Dunkin' Donuts. Now with this new excitement, Rosenberg is super giddy again. He wants to expand again. And as you guys could imagine, Harry Winokur is not very happy. He hasn't been happy at any point with these expansions, but now they're finally doing really well. They have the brick and mortar. What else could they want? Well, Rosenberg wants five more stores. And this is where Harry says, sorry, bud, I, I got a, I got a dip. I can't do this anymore. So in May of 1955, Harry and William dissolve their business relationship. Harry bought, or William buys Harry out of Dunkin' Donuts. And then Harry Winokur starts a competing donut shop called Mr. Donut. And the donut wars begin. Now, imagine how tricky this was. They were family. This was this like divided a family. It's it's the look at my tags is Waylon Williams boy. It's the Hatfields and the McCoys. <laughs> it's the Montagues and the other ones. This is crazy. But they are competitors. And Rosenberg said, you know what? I'm not letting him win. I don't care if we're family. I'm going to win this donut war. So he's he's racking his brain thinking, okay, what can I do? I got to open more stores. I got to be in more places. And he does just that with franchising. Now, this is a really, really new idea at the time. It's the mid 1950s. It's not super. I, I think they might be the first franchisers. I'm not entirely sure. I saw a little I saw different um, information, different places. So I don't want to say they were, but they were definitely one of the first, a pioneer of sorts. Franchising is when a different business owner owns one of the designated shops. So it's instead of Bill Rosenberg running this Dunkin' Donuts, it's John Smith. You know, this is new. It's exciting and it's working. And Rosenberg only asked his franchisees to promise two things. He wanted no donut to be sold if it was over four hours old. And he wanted no cup of coffee to be sold if it was in a pot that was over 18 minutes old. So freshness and consistency were absolutely pivotal for these franchise locations because he wanted to make sure, Rosenberg wanted to make sure that if you went to a location down the street from you and if you went to a location across town from you, you're getting the same level of quality. They actually did this in a really cool way. Like, you know, in now it's probably like timers and they just like have timers go off and let you know when you have to dump the old donuts and put on a new pot of coffee. But back then in 19, you know, 56, They did it with the parchment paper on the donut basket liners. The morning shift was white parchment paper. The afternoon shift was blue parchment paper. And the nighttime shift was red parchment paper. So that's how they knew, oh, okay, the shifts are changing. We're going to toss these donuts, change the parchment. Now we have fresh donuts that we know we can sell. Now it's 1963 and Will brings on his son, Bob, who is a 25-year-old Harvard Business School new graduate. And he brings him on to the company as CEO. And this is a really big change for people. They're shocked. They're, um, oh, uh, I'm so sorry. I had another source and that's where I got a lot of this information too. It is, um, wisdom from the top with Guy Raz. So he actually has an interview with Bob Rosenberg talking about what it was like being a CEO at 25 and working with his dad and da da. And so it's great. It's a great listen. I highly, highly suggest you take, you check it out because I loved it. Now, Bob has seen his dad work this business that he created his whole life. And he's like, well, I don't want to mess it up, but I also know that it can be great. And he sort of takes on his dad's entrepreneurial spirit and is like, let's expand some more. Bob is now expanding all around New England and New York and the East Coast. And he starts to kind of creep down to the South. And if you guys remember from our episode 15, Krispy Kreme, Vernon Rudolph had already been expanding in the South. They already had about 12 to 15 stores around this time. Mr. Bob Rosenberg was like, hey, Vernon Rudolph, love what you've done with the place. Quick question. Could we buy you guys out? And Vernon Rudolph was like, oh, my God, thank you so much. Um, Literally, no, not for any price ever. Thanks, though. And so Bob was like, Got it. Okay, thank you so much. We will figure something else out. (laughs) So in order to keep expanding and keep going into areas and markets that they hadn't been, they needed some more capital. And Bob wasn't exactly sure what to do, but he did eventually take a cue from two other fast food companies that had done this before, McDonald's and KFC, and he went 
public with Dunkin' Donuts. Now, this goes great for a while. There, This is such an intense history. There's so much that happens that Bob tries to start and that Bob, you know, becomes a part of and it's not great ideas business wise. And it's a really in-depth episode that I can't get into all of that. Like there's this crazy class action lawsuit that happens, but then eventually gets dissolved because they're like, oh my God, I'm so sorry, franchisees. So there's a lot. If you guys want to hear more about it, please check out that episode of Wisdom from the Top. So I'm going to kind of like gloss over that part and get to what we're all waiting to hear about, the munchkins. (laughs) Basically, basically, There was all this crazy stuff that happened in like a four year period where the franchisees were not happy with um, Bob and Will Rosenberg and they were just not feeling like appreciated. A lot of them were totally fine and everything was great, but they felt like they were just kind of putting their hands in too many pots, the Rosenbergs. But eventually, one day, Bob gets a call from one of his franchisees in mm, Connecticut, New Haven, and He's like, hey, just so you know, my wife invented this new type of donut cutter that leaves the hole a little bit bigger in the middle. And then we just have been making the donut holes because since they're a franchise, they can kind of do some own stuff with their own business ideas. It's just, um, you know, still under the name of Dunkin Donuts. So. So Bob was like, "Um, "Okay, well, how's that been going? And the franchisee is like, yeah, like. We've been making the donuts, filling them with jelly and selling them. And our revenue has gone up 20 percent. And what I didn't know. So if you didn't know, don't feel bad. That's like I mean, I I could glean, but they were like, that is like unprecedented growth for a retail food store. Like, that's insane. So the next day, Bob and the board members go down to New Haven to see what this fuss is all about. And they see the munchkins for the first time and they're like, done. End of story. We're selling these everywhere. I don't know what the original place called them, but they were originally going to call them penny poppers when they like marketed it across all the Dunkins. But they were like, well, we don't want to be stuck at just selling these for a penny, which I understand. And they were like, oh, Wizard of Oz plays on TV all the time. (laughs) Let's call let's let's name them after the characters that greet Dorothy in the beginning of the Wizard of Oz. However, There was this cookie company in Georgia that already had that name trademarked to use from Wizard of Oz. And so Duncan was like, can we please use it? Because they hadn't even put it on a cookie yet. And they were like, yeah, fine. We'll license we'll license it to you for a dollar a year. So that's how we got the munchkins. And you guys, it's funny to think that a donut hole literally changed the trajectory of Dunkin' Donuts. This pulled them out of any type of trickiness they were in. I think that they had lost $1.7 million the year before. And Bob, this William's son, was almost about to be kicked out as the CEO because the board was like, you've run this into the ground. We're so upset. And he was like, give me one more quarter. And within that quarter, they found Munchkins and Munchkins blew Dunkin' Donuts up forever. Through this innovation, Dunkin' Donuts is like back on top. They're absolutely crushing it. And they start making a lot of other stuff. They're kind of the first ones to introduce flavored coffees. And they're definitely one of the first ones to introduce iced coffee as like a common everyday drink. They introduce frozen drinks and other food items that become super popular. And they have expanded to 17,000 stores in 45 different countries. So they are an international mega star and they sell 1.9 billion cups of hot and iced coffee every single year. So it's just one of these really cool like American dream stories that that worked out really well for him. And um that's the history of Dunkin Donuts. <laughs> I am so curious to hear if you guys are like Dunkin Donut people what your favorite thing is from there and what I should go try for my first. Oh my God. Should that maybe be this week's video? I try Dunkin Donuts for the first time. Let me know in the comments below. Thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you so much for taking a bite out of history with me this week. And I can't wait to take a bite out of history with you next week. Make sure you like, comment, and subscribe down below and check out the Patreon and drink a lot of water and have a good day. I love you. Goodbye.